digital and technological uh, revolutions, coming crises, question mark. Uh, we have six presentations. And please, you can look at the program to see everything in detail. I don't think I need to present each presenter. We, we, we don't have that much time, but uh, let's get going. Each presentation is 15 minutes and uh, use the chat box for any questions or comments that you have. And I will then collect them towards the end. So we have an hour and a half with presentations and then half an hour with Q and A and discussions. And of course, please mute yourself. Uh, and if you, uh, you can also sort of turn off the camera if you want just to save some bandwidth, it's up to you. Uh, first of all, so let me invite Hao Cheng from Nanjing University. Yes, uh, let me share my screen. No, can I? It said I'm not allowed to share screen. What's that? Try again and see. Can you see anything? Can you see that? See my slide? No. no, not yet. So what should I choose? I see a... Uh... Maybe, maybe because you, you arrived late, uh, later than us. Maybe, oh yes. It it's now. coming now. So oh, is this? Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. Is that right? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, but uh, okay, should be this. Okay. Um, my topic is cryptocurrency and innovation shaking the footstone of modern money theory. Cryptocurrency and modern money theory, the two are hot today. Uh, cryptocurrency started from January the 4th, 2009, when first Bitcoin was mined out by Satoshi Nakamoto, who introduced Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, allowing payments without a financial institution. These years, cryptocurrencies have attracted huge attention as well as tremendous investment. Cryptocurrencies have challenged prevailing concept of money, seem to avoid government regulation by employing decentralized financial operation with denationalized de currency. Well, modern money theory emerged in 1996, according to Randy Ray, has been the macroeconomics for sovereign monetary theory systems. Modern money theory, uh, MMT, has sparked hot debate in US as well as in China. It challenged normal consensus to limit fiscal policy capacity, seemed to ease government spending to stabilize economy with its own sovereign money. So, um, cryptocurrency and sovereign money, the two are quite opposite. And sovereign money is absolutely the footstone of MMT. Uh, you can look at uh, some features here comparing this to different kind of money. For cryptocurrency, they usually are in forms of digital money, virtual money, not issued by any government authority or, or chartered institutions. It is generated by miners as a gift for their work. It is secured 
by cryptography and recorded in blockchain. It seems to be designed to have limited quantity or decreasing growth rate of quantity. Well, for sovereign money, uh, in its early forms, it takes the form of metals, paper notes, but now uh, digital currency uh, is likely to be the trend. Sovereign, sovereign money is uh, issued by central banks or chartered institutions as uh, we owe you. Um, it's secured by government power recorded in accounts of financial institutions and usually has no quantity limit. Bitcoin, the most representative cryptocurrency has spurred industry, including the introduction of new cryptocurrencies, the mining initial coin offering of tokens or stable coins, exchange between cryptocurrencies, tokens and sovereign currencies. Why cryptocurrency ma matters? Here, uh, I have five reasons. First, cryptocurrencies are accepted by more and more people. Once Heyman Minsky said that anybody can create money, the problem is to get it accepted. Now, cryptocurrencies have been accepted in quite a few places for things ranging from pizza, medicine, traveling, automations, IT hardware and corporate shares listed in stock exchanges. It is reported that identified crypto asset unique users have surged from 35 million in 2018 to 101 million by the third quarter of 2020. Second, Core crypto assets are held as sound means of value storage in substitution of fiat money assets. Uh, among those investors are uh, famous listed companies such as MicroStrategy, Tesla, Galaxy, Coinbase, etc. According to crypto.com, virtual coins and trade have reached. 10,588 and the total market cap has been over 2 trillion US dollars. And among them, Bitcoin is certainly the number one. It takes the money, uh, it takes the market share over 40%. And the second is Ethereum. And the third reason is that cryptocurrency network can remit proceeds faster, cheaper, and to those remote places where people have no bank accounts. That is, no bank is needed. Uh, AI Salvador, a country of Central America, has approved Bitcoin as its legal tender since September 7th, 2021. It can save bank remitting fees up to 400 million US dollars annually for this country, benefiting 70% residents who rely heavily on foreign remittance but have no bank accounts. Fourth, certain governments, corporations, and individuals are trying to evade economic sanctions, taxations or frustrate operations of normal reserve currencies by switching to cryptocurrency payments. It is reported that about 28.3 billion US dollar equivalent capital have flowed out of China in virtual currencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. by the end of June 2021, which is 1.6 times the total volume of such outflow in 2020. The fifth and the last is that criminal activities such as fraud, laundry, 
and funding terrorism are using cryptocurrency networks to hide up the real resource, uh, the real source of funds. Chinese officers have found that more complicated patterns of fraud and laundry emerged using cryptocurrencies in DeFi ecosystem. So decentralization, the core value in sparing the cryptocurrency innovation, including denationalization and deinstitutionalization, is challenging the status of the sovereign money and the normal operation of the sovereign money systems. The rapid development of decentralized finance, DeFi, with virtual currency as its main body has the potential to substitute sovereign money and traditional financial infrastructure. It can decrease national government's monetary policy or control capacity due to substitution of sovereign money denominated assets to that of cryptocurrency. And it seems to me could be a self-enhanced process of substitution. In the first stage, some households and companies are shifting to cryptocurrency assets. And second, the economy may behave under its potential due to number one, and the inflation rate will rise. More sovereign money needed to achieve government goal under MMT. Repeat the first and the second till hyperinflation occur. The fourth, as most people lose confidence to sovereign money, they would simply abandon such worthless sovereign money. In light of old institutionalism, ceremonial dominance determines the ceremonial feasibility of the range of permissible behavior and the knowledge found incorporated in the institutional structure of society determines the instrumental feasibility of problem solving activities. For many nations prevailing with nationalism and supporting sovereign monetary theory, uh, monetary system, it is natural to find that strict regulations against mining and trading of cryptocurrencies have been or to be imposed soon or later. On the contrary, blockchain, the core tech of cryptocurrency has been widely accepted and adapted to solve real problems, even in nations against cryptocurrencies. Whether central bank digital currencies, CBDC, shall adapt the tech blockchain is still under careful examination and hot debate. So uh, my conclusion, cryptocurrency has entered a new stage competing with sovereign money all around the world, shaking the footstone of modern money theory. It is encouraging to see crypto asset industry are more self-disciplined than beginning stage to prevent criminal usage and complying with local regulation, according to recent report. As to sovereign monetary system, carefully balancing be between value stability and economic stimulus within ecological capacity, as well as systemically improving technological efficiency and lowering transaction costs to advance financial inclusion worth serious consideration by the sovereign authority. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and also, especially for, for being so timely, it was spot on in terms of time. Very, very good. Uh, and if you join late, uh, please submit questions via the chat and I will collect them after all presentations have been done. Thank you. So the next presentation is by Rodrigo and Eric and Sebastiao.
Hi. Can everybody see the, the presentation? Okay, great. So um, my name is Rodrigo. I'm a PhD candidate in economics at Sao Paulo State University. And I'm currently a visiting scholar at Michigan State University. Uh, this paper that I'm presenting today is, sorry, sorry about that, is in co-authorship with Professor Eric Scorsoni from Michigan State and Sebastian Gadges from Sao Paulo State University. That's my university back in Brazil. So uh, with this paper, From the Rule of Thumb to the Rule of the Algorithms, uh, we present an analysis of work platforms in ride-hailing services. Uh, for, for those who are not familiar with ride-hailing, Uber and Lyft are examples of these platforms. So we present an analysis of these platforms through a institutionalist perspective, mainly from John Roger Commons and his view on conflicts in the workplace and transactions. So if we advance using um, the concepts from the uh, original institutionalists, mainly commons, and those who studied uh, industrial relations, they would use the con concept of labor problems to understand these conflicts in the workplace. Uh, so uh, what conflicts do we observe in um, modern days platform work, especially in ride hailing companies? is that even though these workers are not considered employees uh, by these platforms, and in many countries they're not considered employees by current legislation, these workers are organizing in unions, associations, and uh, online forums to react against account deactivation, uh, wage policies or rate policies, these platforms, and security. Uh, whether for um, security of their jobs, of the way they work, and for damages for their cars. And these workers are organizing, and we chose uh, John Roger Commons and his field on economics uh, to try to understand how the institutionalist perspective can help us understand this phenomenon of platform workers today. Uh, so we start uh, acknowledging that for Commons, the conflicts in the, the, of the workers, the conflicts in the workspace were not only related to wages, but also to management. And where's management in, in the Commonsian theory? So when Commons is dealing with his three types of transactions, the bargaining, the rationing, and managerial transactions, uh, he's, he's explaining that society is not dealing with abundance but rather society is dealing with scarcity. Uh, scarcity, both a natural scarcity in the relation of man to nature and an artificial scarcity, that is the relation of man to man generated by the institutionalized uh, uh, proprietary, um, um, sorry, sorry about that. The institutionalized, property rights. So property rights create artificial scarcity. And how do society deal with these two kinds of scarcity two, through transactions? So bargaining transactions and rationing transactions would deal with the scarcity by the exchange of property rights in the case of bargaining transactions and the distribution of wealth in the rationing transactions. But in the case of managerial transaction, it's not the property rights that are being exchanged or wealth is being uh, distributed, but it is a process of creating new wealth. So this creation of new wealth happens inside of the going concern as a firm in the relation of a legal superior commanding the shock rules to a legal inferior in this process of achieving the going concerns objectives. So a legal superior in the case of a firm could be, um, could be the foreman and the worker, the employer and the employee. And this relation is guided by uh, working rules of command and control, command and obedience, command in the side of the legal superior 
and obedience in the side of the legal inferior. So the go looking at the firm as a going plan, it has two structures. One, what Commons is calling the going plan is the material structure in which wealth is created. So it's where workers, the, the building, the machines are in the process of creating use values happens. In the going business, and inside, it's, it's about scarcity values. It's about bargaining and prices. So if we are studying management of the labor force, we are focusing now in the going plant. So the going plant is a process uh, based on efficiency to create new wealth. And workers and machines and the material building that the company has it's all managed by this producing organization that is the proportioning of the supply of prices, as Thomas explains, of the mental and sorry, the physical, mental, and managerial faculties of all those who are employed in this process of creating new wealth. So, what are the main objectives of a going concern? They are the valuation of wealth and the creation of new wealth, the valuation of wealth in the going business, and the creation of new wealth in the going plant through the processes of managerial uh, bargaining between a legal superior and a legal inferior. So when Commons was reading the attitudes of the firms towards workers, he observed uh, different theories and different attitudes of the firms towards these workers. So from his Industrial Goodwill of 1919 comes present two theories, the theory of commodities and the second theory is the machinery theory. There are ways of treating workers differently. So the commodity theory would consider the labor market as a commodity market, meaning that workers' wages and compensations were determined by supply and demand. And on the other side, machinery theory would not see workers as, as commodities, but uh, as machines, machines to be economized. That's a quote from Commons 1919. And workers' compensation is not related to supply and demand, but by the output and how workers could produce uh, in, the, in their daily transactions with capital. But both of these theories overlook the role of workers' goodwill, that workers are employed uh, at their will, and that workers have their human nature that couldn't be overlooked. And uh, in the study of the labor problems, uh, it is important to point out that Commons is writing in a moment where capitalism was not, was far from equilibrium. And these workers uh, were facing a threat of the institutionalists were looking at threats, outside threats to liberal democracies and how could they uh, save capitalism in the words of commons. So um, an important critique of commons from the machinery theory is his critique of scientific management from Taylor. So for him, scientific management was a case of managerial, um, managerial transactions what happened in scientific management is that they transfer from the rule of thumb or the experience in the production process in the daily basis of the company in creating new value, they transferred that to engineers and specialists to systematize the shop rules or the working rules of the shop, reducing the process of production into the study of motion. Each of these all of the activities were reduced to the study of motion. So the best worker for that job would be the one who would be hired for that. For commons, that would be, that would mean an autocratic management. So the rule of thumb would be substituted by the rule of science in which workers have no voice, uh, no capacity of representation inside of scientific management. And in that, capitalism in Commonsville was failing to guarantee labor's job security. 
uh, by denying them their voice in defining the work rules of the of the shop or of their production. So now I turn uh, my final comments to the rule of the algorithm. That's uh, my project for my dissertation, my PhD dissertation. So if we're talking about a digital platform, where's the go and plan? If we consider the go and plan as the machines or building where workers go to produce use values. So um, I argue that we argue that we should look to the producing organization and how this firm and how these platforms produce uh, their final products, their use values of rights. So these producing organizations are based in the structure of the apps and the rules of these apps. So workers are not uh, working of their will. They're not working um, as they want to, but they have to follow rules. They're not very clear and they are defined by the algorithms of the platforms. At the same time, this producing organization uses managerial practices and managerial transactions between a legal superior and an inferior and how the platform manages this workforce that's not even considered employees. They use dynamic prices to induce workers to go to a, to a place where the demand for the rights are higher. And a point that is really important is that the foreman in a sense of a, of a tailor's foreman taking care of workers does not exist anymore, but the rating system substitute the role of the foreman to evaluate workers and to evaluate their performance. So workers are now subject to subjective criteria of evaluation for their clients. And these problems have been treated in literature and how these rating systems can uh, go to unreasonable directions. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can ask, what is the employment relationship here? And the employment relationship, if it is accepted or not, it it reminds us of the of Commons discussion of the sweat system and how this sweat system created social distancing between workers and capital and destroying any any kind of um, bargaining between workers and, and capital. So a social distancing between these these workers. And uh, one, one important aspect that I wanted to point out is also that workers and rest in times of crisis have been uh, promising places for platforms to grow. So in the case of Brazil and the middle of uh, economic crisis and millions of unemployed platforms have become uh, the main source of income for millions of, of workers. So how can these unregulated markets where there's no other options for these workers, how can we deal with that when the competitive managers uh, don't create any inducement or platforms don't have any reason to change the way they deal with these workers who are in a situation of, in the middle of a crisis, they don't have any other options. So reasonable transactions would be those transactions where workers have options other than just being unemployed. So how can these unregulated markets be dealt with? So this text from Addison from free markets and undesirable destinations and Woodcock and Grant also makes us think in what direction can the institutional field today look at uh, platform workers and try to understand if the future of work is a desirable future in the way it is today, or if it's reasonable or not in a sense of a Comanzian fashion. So with that, I, I finish my presentation now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for an interesting presentation. Uh, next up is Anton. Yes.
you can see my slides. Hello? Yes? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, then I start. In Western economies, dualism between labor and capital artificially evolved into dualism between human data and capital. Internet firms extract data from users in exchange for access, accompanying infringement of privacy and indecent belt differentials require an update of commons reasonableness approach. An updated third way seems to be the way to go. I start with some remarks concerning the institutional approach by John R. Kant. Then I shortly elaborate one of the changes since Commons, the search of libertarianism. I follow with some notes on the outgrowth of libertarianism, namely data extraction, which contributed to rising wealth differentials. Rising wealth differentials require changes in the path of determining reasonableness. I end my presentation with some conclusions and discussions notes. Commons developed the institutional economics that differs in about 25 aspects from classical or hedonistic economics. Commons saw an artificial evolution from corporal property rights to respectively incorporeal and intangible property rights. In other words, property rights based on respectively fiscal goods, credit and debit, and expected opportunities. He proposed two paths of determining reasonableness to save capitalism from fascism or communism. Commons sketched a politics and judicial path to a reasonable society and economy. With Commons' third way approach, he took the edge of his heavily criticized initial wealth distribution theory. Since Commons, Western society and economy have changed dramatically. One of the changes is the rise of libertarianism. The libertarian journey culminated in the election of President Donald Trump. Libertarians assume, in essence, sovereign individuals. This assumption is embraced and supported by several leaders in Silicon Valley. Libertarians believe in spontaneous order and oppose progressive taxation, antitrust law, and social security. In the raging waves of libertarianism, the libertarian-minded Tea Party members have become a power of influence within the GOP and the Republican electorate. This power cannot be ignored. The internet is born in an ethos of a libertarian free market utopia and the libertarian content for a centralized authority. This resulted in a capitalized rise of a new phenomenon, exploitation of virtual property. Virtual property is not only the data extracted from your behavior on the internet and the internet of things, but also the data in the form of your contributions to the internet, for example, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and your uploaded personal data. Who owns your digital you? In terms of Commons legal economic nexus formula, the relation between provider of digital, digital access to users is theoretically a liberty exposure relation. Reciprocity between liberty and exposure of providers and users of economic platforms is not equal. The provider of digital access is in reality immune, while the user is disabled because of social network dependence. Especially the big tech companies benefited from the unequal reciprocity between liberty and exposure 
in addition to tax policies, their oligopolistic position, quantitative easing and cheap money policies that inflated housing markets, stocks and cryptocurrency. This resulted in a rise of especially tech companies in the Forbes Global 2000 Companies rankings. Analog to the rise of market value of tech companies, CEOs in tech companies and Steve Jobs has rose on the Forbes World Billionaires list in 2021. The third way is the best real world illustration of Commons vision of a nation focused on reasonableness. Since World War II, the collective and judicial path to reasonableness resulted in an institutionalized intergroup and multiple competition between workers, employers, consumers, producers, students, and benefit recipients. The collective path of to reasonableness has become frustrated by political developments, change in memberships of labor organizations, and market power concentration. The judicial path is threatened by criticisms on democratic governance. The neoliberal plea for small governments defends proper judicial performance. To walk the path of reasonableness, judges should start with the public purpose as a primary of an investigation. Collective goals regarding data extraction are determined by conflicting powers of stakeholders. Selling and buying through the internet is in essence a judicial question to be decided by Supreme Courts. However, online transactions are also a legislative question. Several issues, issues warrant governmental intervention, regulation, or redistribution of wealth and income across. To reach reasonable legislation, regulation interventions, and effective implementation of laws, all stakeholders should get involved. Along with the rise of social media and the shift towards exploitation of data, the multidisciplinary character of institutional economics is challenged. This requires adaptations in different disciplines in order to be able to determine reasonableness. In line with this, the design of the internet is challenged. To give you ownership of your federal property, your personal data might become reg registered with blockchain technology and be saved in a sort of digital vault that you own. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Anton. Uh, we are actually ahead of time, which is great news. Uh, the next person to talk is Scott. Did you yeah, you managed to sort out the camera in the meantime. Yeah, okay, good. You got that. We can and see I, you. And I'm, yeah. I apologize for not having that up earlier. I was able to resolve that while, we, while I was listening. Okay, um, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm hitting F5. I want I want it in more of a context of the whole thing, but I don't want to waste any of our time here. So let's just move forward. So where I'm coming from is I'm coming from the Permian Basin. And and so I'm I'm just so you know, I'm setting my stopwatch right now. And this is one of the larger oil and gas regions around. And so I'm taking an event of the, I would say uh, 2012 to 2014 fracking revolution to say, how does this affect relationships between it within the industry? So what are we going to discuss? We're gonna say how the fracking and horizontal drilling revolutions changed equity and project market risks because of the technological changes. That's the first question. Second question is, with the advent of these new recovery techniques, how were the independent and major firm level equity returns related to market and commodity excess return variation? And what we're going to do is we're going to develop or use a difference in decompositions approach to after we find out 
whether or not the larger independents and majors, how they do, how do they do relative to each other? And what are the sources of those changes with the fracking revolution? Why is this important? The fracking revolution is one of the most important events in modern economic history. Ben Bernanke of the Federal Service said that as well as others. The price of uh, petroleum decreasing uh, in the early to, uh, in the 2010s, it's a significant event. So how does this play out? For years, Texas A&M, uh, te the Texas A&M engineer, George P. P. Mitchell, he ex experimented with alternative drilling techniques in the Barnett Formation. Now, so you know where the Barnett Formation is, for those of you who may not be in the States or understand the industry or have exposure to the industry. Barnett is over in East Texas, basically on top of uh, Fort Worth and Dallas, or underneath Fort Worth and Dallas. This effort uh, for, from Mitchell eventually paid off for natural gas. So what happens is you inject fluids into the well. You have this shale. Traditional views are that you, you, you take a pumping station, you drop it vertically, and you, you suck all the stuff up with a straw. What's happened with these revolutionary times, most of us understand there's a shell under the ground, which is not totally uh, oil-based at that point. So injecting fluids, now it's not just water, but there are other types of additives given to the fluids, and you inject that into the well, and that helps uh, fracture and allows the petro petroleum products to, to seep out of it. This is George P. Mitchell, and he was at the forefront uh, over in the Barnett Shell in Dallas, Fort Worth. I'm about 400, 600 miles from it, 400 miles of better estimate. It next goes to a Harold Ham. He uses it in the Bakken, which is up in North Dakota, and he does it to look for crude oil. And they're quite successful at this. Now, the horizontal drilling and fracking changed product, project risk. Prod, project risk. What that means is they became so advanced is that they could at, they they can right now is drop a, a, a shaft. 11,000 feet under, uh, underground and hit the physical size of a, a, type, a, a pie pin to be able to extract oil from that. And then also you're, they're able to go instead of just vertically, they're able, after they get the vertical, they can have a 90 degree or other degree uh, change so they can go out and get oil in different uh, stratus geologically. So this is an important event economically. So we want to think about what's happening with the, the configuration in the oil industry. Traditionally, what you have are these large super majors uh, with access to uh, labor and capital. Both majors and independents are going to have access to uh, capital and labor, but the majors are going to have a little bit easier access because of many times their path dependence. So majors have operations in every part of the upstream, midstream, and downstream production. We'll explain that in a moment. Examples of the, of the majors are ExxonMobil, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ENI, and Total. The independents are the smaller firms. They specialize in specific segments of the oil and gas industry. And these include exploration and production. That means the companies that go out and find, locate, and start drilling. Examples of this, Apache, Concho, Diamondback. Equipment and services service the, the upstream, sometimes downstream and midstream, but they're primarily, especially with the fracking revolution, moving more into actually doing the fracking itself. Examples of this are Halliburton and Schlumberger. Midstream, or these are the folks that say, okay, you, you've extracted the petroleum. Now, how do we get that stuff to, uh, to refiners? Examples of this, Plains All America, Marathon Oil. There, there's very niche uh, companies in, in the midstream and downstream. So refining, or these are the people who, oil's just gooey stuff until you uh, refine it into a usable product such as petroleum, kerosene. Examples of these companies would be Holly Frontier, Kinder, Kinder Morgan, there are others. So the industry, uh, the industry organization, the oil and gas industry is characterized by these large major firms. These were once, uh, where once smaller firm independents show their value, 
independents are acquired or combine their assets with other independents and or majors. And this is where there's a lot of dynamism in this industry. So is the oil and gas industry competitive? It depends on who you ask. Obviously, in, at the international level, the industry is highly concentrated among state agents. For example, Saudi Aramco, Pemex, Petrobras, the, the, these uh, countries, they, they have access to 90% of proven reserves. So there's no question where the price is really being driven. However, if you speak with somebody in the industry in the US or Canada, it, it, it is described as highly competitive. So let's think about majors. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to break uh, daily returns to these companies' equities to say, how well off are they? That, how are the, the owners doing of the majors, the large major folks, versus the smaller independents? Now, the smaller independents are still relatively large. So if we just look at the ma majors, the important thing we want to focus is on the last line. Between 2008 and 2018, you almost have no change in the average daily expected return on equities. The risk, uh, as illustrated by standard deviation, is not uh, tremendously high, as we'll see in a moment. And the Sharpe ratio. Now, Sharpe ratio is a measure of expected returns relative to the risk that you have to bear. Everything else the same, folks want to have higher sharp ratios to say, I'll hold that asset. So comparing the majors that, that are listed on the left-hand column to the independents that are again listed on the uh, left-hand column, but there are multiple uh, of the majors, I mean, of the independents, we see that the expected returns between 2018 and 2000, uh, 2008 and 2018 for the independents actually increased where it was pretty much flat or, or, or negative for the majors. The risk is higher for these independents. Why? Because they are at different strata of the oil and gas production. They're taking on greater risk. And the Sharpe ratios or their returns relative to risk they actually go up between that period where the majors, it went down. Okay, so what we want to do to, to make an important conclusion as to how well off are these two segments of the industry, well, let's just do a pre-fracking, post-fracking analysis of these areas of mean ex or expected returns versus risk versus uh, the sharp ratios uh, between the periods. So what we can say, the most important is the lower right-hand corner. In terms of differences, if we look at the differences between the pre and post, the expected returns for the majors goes down. The expected risk for the majors goes down. That, that's a good. The, the first part, expected returns going down, that's not good. Expected risk going down, that's good. But overall, the expected sharp ratios for the big guys, they're going, it's going, it, it went down with this new technological innovation. So we want to look at the same co uh, comparison for the independents. This is a uh, firm level, but what we really want to uh, focus on is the average down here. We, we see that the independents, they, their expected returns also went down with the advent of fracking and horizontal drilling. And their sharp ratios also went down. So preliminary conclusions. First, the expected returns have decreased for both majors and independents between the pre and post vacuum periods. However, the majors expected return decrease is smaller than the independents. That's good for majors. Number two, decrease in risk is more negative for, uh, for independents than majors, which is good for independents. Independents, they're the ones who are out going out at the upper level upstream and they, or the, the new technological innovation means a project success is more likely after the fact. And that's good for the independents. But the overall effect, there's a decrease in sharp ratios, which is return per unit of risk. And this is better for the majors overall. So overall, the fracking revolution has been better for ma majors than the independents. But now what we want to do is we want to think about the sources of those differences. So we, I've developed this issue of a difference in decompositions. Now you can have differences in, in, in firm returns across groups between the independents and the majors. That's what uh, the across group uh, 
the decomposition does. It says, how do independent and majors return vary before and after the fracking revolution and the corresponding sources of, of the revolution? Then we can also do it within groups. We can say on the left-hand side uh, for both equations, uh, you have how does the gap between independence before and after change and relative to the gap before and after for majors. So the first thing we can look at is we can look at the just raw coefficients. So these are averaged across the different firms, but the important thing we see the returns to the S&P, which is the equity market access to capital, actually goes down for the majors after or with the fracking revolution, but it goes down by more for the independents. The post-fracking return is 1.02, whereas the pre-fracking return for the independents is 1.26. That's the first part for equity return variation. Now we want to think about in terms of commodity, the actual oil product coming out. Oil returns goes up doubles for the majors, and it only goes up a, a smaller bit for the independents. Then some, some of these other issues are used in the literature just, just to not uh, commit some type of omitted variable issue. So the difference in decompositions, the first equation, how, in other words, how do independent majors return vary before and after uh, the fracking revolution? Well, let's look down, well, well the gap between independence and majors after is smaller, this negative uh, under total for across difference and difference level sum total, that negative says that the gap between the independence and majors was smaller after the revolution than before the revolution. But we can go down lower and in proportions, we can say, well, what are the sources of this variation? It's actually the case that the independents who are using more advanced newer technologies, their returns go up in terms of just the rates of return to the activity. They go up for both equations. We don't want to get too far into that equation because we don't have the time for it. And uh, then we can do the same thing within. And the within group, just to stay within time, it says that the within group for independence actually increases by more. So just by verbally what's going on. So let's bring all of this together. The oil and gas producers did worse after the fracking revolution. Their profitability, I don't want to say profitability, their expected returns to owners, therefore information regarding project risk actually goes down after the fracking revolution. The risks are lower, but overall this measure of returns per unit of risk, that goes down for everybody. It's better for the majors than for the independents by a, a level that we just mentioned a moment ago. It doubles for the commodity returns and the decrease in major equity returns were actually smaller, which is a good. Sources across group equity and commodity market returns were greater for independents than majors. Natural gas largely was never a, a, a factor. And within groups, equity and commodity uh, market returns were greater, greater for the majors and independents. So in the end, the majors have done better, but everybody's done a little bit worse. It'll be interesting to see how things uh, fall out in the next couple of years. So that's my discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Uh, the next presentation is by David. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's share. Slide. Well, here. Yeah. Um, Hi everybody, I'm David Keller from France, uh, uh, assistant professor in, uh, at the University of Angers in economics. And uh, I would like to, to discuss about the digital revolution and its consequence on the competition policies. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, the digital revolution uh, has uh, different 
uh, can be seen in a different perspective, uh, an, optimist, uh, an optimistic view, uh, which is, of course, the view of uh, Hal Varian. Uh, of course, you know maybe that he's the chief economist uh, of Google. That's why uh, he likes uh, digital revolution. Uh, it's paid, it's paid for this. And uh, for him, um, a digital revolution uh, implies a more efficient and personalized contract. It helps uh, innovation and the recombination of knowledge. And also for him, uh, the platform firms uh, provide uh, information technologies that help uh, uh, small business uh, to become uh, what he called a micro multinational. Uh, as you can read here, this is a quotation uh, where um, uh, Varian explained that uh, today, even tiny companies with a handful of employees have access to communication services that only the largest multinationals could afford 20 years ago. These micro multinationals can operate on a global scale because, because the cost of computation and communication has fallen dramatically. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the, 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 the last advantage or the last not inconvenient for, for for Brian is that uh, monopoles are not so much an issue uh, in the digital uh, economy because uh, they even when they, when you find a monopole you can achieve uh, increase the consumer welfare. Uh, this is another quotation of Brian, where in in this book he writes that a perfectly discriminating monopolist can capture all surplus for itself and therefore produce Pareto efficiency output. And competition among perfectly discriminating monopolists will transfer their surplus uh, to consumers, yielding the same outcome as pure competition. Uh, it's kind of a challenging quote, I, I believe. Of course, you have other economists and sociologists and intellectuals that are, have a vision more uh, that cr criticize uh, the digital revolution and its consequences, both on ec for economic and, and also for democratic uh, uh, questions issues. Uh, of course, one of the most important is uh, Shoshana Zuboff, who wrote a very interesting book in, uh, in 2019. And for Zuboff, the, the main issue about the digital economy and especially the platform firms is that uh, these firms collect personal data and, and with this data, they, they, um, they are able to manipulate behavior. Therefore, they put uh, uh, some some question about the ability of uh, about the individual autonomy. Uh, here, uh, another quote of um, of uh, Shoshana, uh, Shoshana Zuboff: uh, "Industrial capitalism transforms natural raw materials into communities, and surveillance capitalism, the capitalism of uh, the digital economy." lays its claim to the stuff of human nature for a new community invention. Now it is human nature that is scrapped, torn, and taken for another century's market project. As you can see, this quotation has some links uh, with uh, Karl Polanyi's vision of uh, the commodification of the world uh, produced by capitalism. Uh, another very interesting author which uh, is French, and therefore he wrote a book in French that will be translated in English, uh, I think, next year, uh, is uh, Cédric Durand. For Cédric Durand, the question is not only the question of uh, individual autonomy. The digital economy creates a totally new system, a post-capitalist system uh, that he called uh, techno-feudalism. Uh, in this book, uh, Cédric Durand explained that the reference to feudalism refers to the rentier, non-productive character, character of the value capture system. And we find this idea of the prevalence of rent of a productive logic in the case of intangible, intensive firms, particularly platforms. Therefore, for Cédric Durand, it is a global new system that emerged from the digital revolution. And the thing is, the digital uh, economy also challenges the competition policies. And I will focus more on this aspect. Uh, there are three reasons why the digital economy changed competition. The first reason, of course, is, is that it increases economies of scale and network effect. And for this reason, big companies are usually more efficient 
uh, than small businesses. Therefore, it means that uh, they become monopolistic and, uh, and until there is no more competition. This, this effect also proved that if they are more efficient, then you should keep them as a monopolist. And this is the reason why, according to the Chicago School Doctrine, um, the, the competition policies tend to be less interventionist because uh, it will not be good for the global welfare to dismantle monopolies that are more efficient than small firms. But there are all other aspects uh, that deal with competition with a digital revolution. The second aspect is that the digital economy tends to can restrain the access to the market. And we have a, a very interesting uh, uh, debate between Epic Games and, and Apple uh, recently. Uh, you know, Epic Games uh, is uh, the company that uh, produced um, Fortnite, the, the game that uh, you can find on, on every smartphone if you want, it's free. But there are some, of course, some, some uh, commission that Apple asked for, for this uh, producer of application. And uh, my big game was uh, considering that this commission was too, in, too important and uh, therefore it couldn't access the, the market. Um, and there was a, a court decision uh, in favor of Epic Games, uh, Epic Games against Apple. But this raised another question. Uh, in, on the smartphones, you have a duopoly, Apple and Google. And if you want to access to the consumer, to the smartphone, then you need to go through uh, Google and Apple who can have uh, make you pay a commission for this. So this raises another second important question about com uh, competition. And third, uh, the third question is of course, the ability to access and exploit personal data. Uh, this is due to, uh, to, to, to some platform firms. And these firms are because they need to, to access more data, they tend to become generalist conglomerate. They tend to diversify their activity, like Apple, who is now pro uh, uh, producing series and video, like Amazon. And, um, and you can see that uh, these companies, they tend to become not only monopolistic on one market, but they tend to, to, to become like the huge conglomerates on every market in order to access to specific behavior, digital behavior from their consumer. And this means that the competition, uh, competition policies is, um, cannot catch these things because they are not in one market, they are in several markets. So you need new forms of regulation in order to, uh, to, to think about this, to, to deal with this. Um, now, the competition policies in history had had a different kind of goals. They didn't always have a, a, an economic uh, aim. For instance, the Sherman Act in uh, 1890 uh, was no, a non-economic uh, uh, law. It didn't uh, aim to, um, to, to protect the consumer or to, uh, to, or to, to make market efficient. It aims primarily to protect small businesses from the productive behavior of monopolies. In fact, it was a, a, a demand from the small oil producers uh, who uh, were less efficient uh, than the standard oil. And they asked for the Senator Sherman to protect them. So this is the reason why this law, in fact, is a kind of populist law. Uh, it aims to, to protect the small, but the small inefficient producer against the, the big efficient producer. This is the reason why economists at first, they didn't really like this law. They, they, they did not approve very, very well this law, especially in the Chicago school. Uh, but uh, 40 years after in the 1930s, confronted with uh, the NIRA uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, uh, some, some new policies that were more interventionist, uh, the Chicago school uh, uh, decided that this uh, competition law finally was a lesser evil than the interventionism of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, Roosevelt, of, of Roosevelt. And in fact, in the 1930s, because of the crisis, there was a big discussion about uh, the laissez-faire. And uh, most economy, most the society didn't want any more laissez-faire because it couldn't solve the crisis. 
And some economists at this moment, they, they try to think differently uh, the market economy. And their main idea was that the market economy itself alone could not, uh, uh, has to be supported by the state, by some kind of intervention. This is what I call neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is not laissez-faire policy. It's a, a doctrine uh, that uh, tends to think that the market markets are not natural and therefore they need to be supported by the state. In the neoliberalism, you have two kinds of two, two, two different approaches. The German approach, which is called also order liberalism, and this approach aims to ensure fair market access and to create a market social economy. It is a rule-based approach. It means that uh, the goal of the new uh, order liberal, German neoliberalism, is to implement a constitutional economic system. Uh, and then you have also the second, uh, the, the Chicago School, but not the first one, the second one, uh, which uh, uh, is in fact, uh, it is the Chicago School of Milton Friedman and, and our own director. And um, in their vision, the competition policies uh, have to achieve a market efficiency and to protect the consumer. And this, this is, therefore, they are less interventionist than the other liberal approach. In order to clarify what I'm, what I call neoliberalism, and is also a, a way to answer to, uh, to, to Antun, who, who asked me a question by mail. Uh, uh, I don't think neoliberalism uh, has something to do with libertarianism. Uh, the neoliberalism is really uh, an idea that this is a framework of the of neoliberalism. Uh, the, the goal is to, 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 to make the state serve the market. And the market uh, should be a, a competitive market because it should uh, create a price system that will create the social order. And in order to be efficient and to be fair, uh, it must have uh, some competition, a fair competition here, the second pillar. Uh, it must also have free trade and social order and price stability. And these four pillars maintain the market because the market by itself cannot work. And this is uh, the difference between neoliberalism and laissez-faire on libertarians, if you, will, if you want. In fact, uh, among the neoliberals, there were uh, a very important debates uh, from the, the, the German tradition and the American tradition. Uh, they were present, they, they already exist in the Lippmann Colloquium in 1938. Uh, in this colloquium, there was an opposition between Rostov, uh, the German auto liberal economist and sociologist, and Ludwig von Mises. One, the first one uh, was pr 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 asked for a strong state uh, because he believed that without the state, if the state would not take care of competition, then the competition will, will disappear under the pressure of economy, uh, of the uh, natural the economy for, for also would lead naturally to monopoles. Whereas for Mises, the monopoles were the consequence of the interventionism. Therefore, he believed that any intervention will destroy the market. Uh, the first Chicago school uh, of the 1930s were, was very close to the auto liberal approach. Uh, but then uh, after uh, the World War II, under the influence of the Austrian ideas, uh, it, it changed its, its, uh, its approach to become uh, uh, more or less interventionist and to praise more uh, consumer welfare against uh, the, the rule and the fairness of competitors. In the European Union, uh, there was also some questions because when the Rome Treaty was signed, the text about the competition was not very clear and there was some ambiguous uh, interpretation. Therefore, what happened for Gerber in 1994 is that the new order liberal doctrine gives some meaning and allow the European authorities to, to adopt a more strict uh, vision of competition policy. Uh, the thing is, um, in the 1980s, uh, the, the US uh, courts uh, adopt, kind of adopt the conception of uh, the Chicago School. But since the year 2000, the digital revolution put some, 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 some changes 
in the in this approach and especially since uh, in Europe since the Ammonia and Vespergier commissions uh, the vision of um, the role of the competition of the competition policy policy change in order to to adapt uh, to the new challenge of the digital uh, uh, revolution but I believe that uh, uh, this adaptation miss the most important point the, and from, for, for me and this is the, the point of the paper and I, I will conclude on the, on the second on the, on the, it is my <laughs> almost the last slide uh, for me the main question uh, with the digital revolution is not that you need more intervention and more competition policies it is that you enter a world where the market itself is challenges. Think about uh, Ronald Cause. For, for Cause, there is a trade-off when you want to have a transaction. Uh, you can choose either the firm or the market. The firm uh, push you towards a hierarchical transaction. It is planified, it's organized. And then you can uh, bargain with, your, with other people in order to have an autonomous transaction in the market. But when you think about the digital economy, like Uber or any other kind, kind of, 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 of platforms, you, you, you are comforted with a, a transaction that does not occur in a firm totally. It is not a year to go. And uh, it, it is not autonomous either because the platform organize the meeting of producers and, and consumers. Uh, the platform calculate the, the prices and uh, the platform implement the transaction. Therefore, what the platform does, in fact, is exactly what Hayek believed was impossible. It aggregates uh, data and knowledge into a centralized device that organizes transactions without the usual cost of the market. Therefore, the main issue of the digital economy is not the fairness of the market. It is not the ability for small consumer producers to access it, but it is the disappearance of the market itself. The digital platform is not a way to better manage the market, but it is an alternative to the market. Therefore, if there is no market anymore, if the price is not the result of free bargaining and free competition, but the result of a privately owned algorithm that work like a black box, uh, then the whole conception, the whole neoliberal conception of the social order is challenged. And the, for me, it means that um, we need to think the economy uh, without believing in the market, in the pre-market anymore, because for this uh, the digital uh, economy, the market and the competitive market and the free bargaining of individuals that create prices uh, is not anymore uh, the device that organizes transactions. So I believe we need to think beyond the neoliberal framework in order to, to answer the issues raised by the digital economy. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, David. And uh, now to the last presentation, which is by Manuel and Magda. Hello. Let me share the screen. Share screen. Okay. Sure. You can see my screen. Yes. Okay. This. Sorry. Here we go. Where I present here. I'm using this Google Google um presentation i think this button it's not this but can you read like this or not it's difficult it's, it's okay but if you what you can do here is just to increase the size you can zoom in for instance if you zoom in to 150 percent or something it should okay, be I'll do that uh, where here. Uh, yeah, uh, no, yeah, too much. Too, too <laughs> much. But yeah, something if you go 100%, let's see what happens there. Let me see. 
I think that's better. Much. And if you just uh, yeah, make the screen a little bit bigger if you can, so we can if see I the can. whole. Uh, oh, I I don't know how to. There is a boot, but present. That's it. It worked. Yes. Perfect. That's fine. Okay. Let's begin. Um, I'm going to present here the paper, the dynamics of encapsulation, innovation, annihilation, and contradiction in practice. This paper is a part of a broad interdisciplinary research carried forward by uh, my co-author, Magda Ribeiro, and me. We can classify our research in the field of science, technology, and society on one side and on the other side within a radical understanding of institutional economics. Magda is a professor of anthropology at the University of Minas Gerais, and I'm a professor of institutional economics at the Federal University of ABC, both universities in Brazil. So let's start. This paper emphasized that original institutional economics perspective on technology, encapsulation, corporate hegemony, and the potential mismatch between institutions and social provisioning offers an interesting, interesting analytical framework to understand innovative and annihilative contradictory process within contemporary capitalism. Our aim here is to show the foundation of this analytical framework and two case studies. In this sense, we have selected two different phenomena to demonstrate our perspective. The first concerns the contradictory relationship between biotechnology, genetic engineering, and biodiversity. The second concerns the problematic relationship between heterodox and mainstream economics in 21st century. Annihilation is the current element in contemporary analysis of neoliberal order where bureaucracy, terror, massacre, the limited vast populations in words of that, part of what the philosopher Achille Mende called necropower. This is not strange for institutionalism. Broadly speaking, we can state that Veblen or Karl Polanyi works focus on the destructive nature of market order. For institutionalism, innovation and annihilation combined. Regarding uh, our original institutional economics perspective, we must start by the centrality of corporate power. In this sense, uh, it's worth highlighting the relevance of Bill Duggar's uh, observation, who continuing the Veblenian argument, note that despite educational, military, political, and religious institutions, all of these will be subject to the corporation as a dominant institution. On the other side, Paul Day Bush highlights that part of the possibilities for technological change could be controlled by ceremonial interests. Technology change might be domesticated in what they do not alter the status quo. This procedure called ceremonial encapsulation largely placed businessmen and corporations as the relevant agents in the selection and implementation of appropriate technologies to maintain their power. Following this, institutionalists sees innovations and annihilations as part of encapsulation process. Innovation is the result of a selection distinguishing from a set of activities, artifacts, ideas, which can be submitted to corporation ceremonial objectives, which most often meet marketable requirements. The selection may, may immediately be called an annihilation, not in the Schubertian sense of creative destruction, but in the sense of destroying everything that does not match corporate interests. This can include not only social useful technologies, but the environment, ideas, and finally, humanity itself. Another, moreover, the contradiction is at the heart of original institutional economics understanding of institutional process. We must remember that Wemblen considered the life-threatening life institutions 
institutions that emerge in opposition to the improvement of society's provision and process as imbecile institutions. For us, innovation and annihilation imply standardization, which is contradictory to the elements subsidizing innovation. Our perspective aims to present the contradiction as an analytical framework suitable for capturing the dynamics of apparently dissimilar phenomena within corporate hegemony in 21st century. So we have case one here to, well, going to, to try to apply our analytical framework. Case one, it's about biotechnology, GMOs, and biodiversity. The advancement of microbiology, particularly from 1950s onwards, led to numerous tests and experiments aimed to transferring genes between bacteria, culminating in the pioneer patent of a living organism requested by General Electric in 1980. Still in the 80s, a well-known partnership between international corporation Monsanto and Washington University successful, successfully conducted gene transfer between plants and this was the beginning of GMO crops. The anthropologist Paul Rabinow, in the context of his famous field research at Cetus Corporation, defined biotechnology as, I call him, the potential, potential to move away from nature by constructing uh, artificial conditions in which specific variables become known so they can be manipulated. This came as a result of two technologies, the first polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and recombinant DNA technology, RDT. The result was impactful. From a mean of production, reconstituting itself in each productive period, the seed became an artificial raw material completely consumed in each period. PCR and RDT technology enabled the transformation of natural seeds in GMOs. It's important to emphasize for us, for our perspective, that genes are combined with this technology, but life is not created in laboratory. It becomes patentable in laboratory. As an innovation, GMO will meet the novelty requirements to become a property for the corporation that control genetic manipulation. In this sense, creating genetically modified seeds depends on the presence of different natural varieties or biodiversity. Moreover, as an innovation, increased productivity of GMOs becomes essential in advancing monoculture. And consequently, appears a, mechan as a mechanism for the annihilation of the natural varieties of biodiversity. The analytical framework becomes obvious. Biotechnology is the interface between biodiversity and innovation. However, the encapsulated technological process results in annihilation of the same biodiversity. And this is the contradiction. Now we have case two. And we, want, we will present something about the connections of the, or, or the relationship between mainstream economics and heterodoxy in 21st century. According to David Dekesh, mainstream economics could be understood as a sociological concept. <coughs> Sorry. For him, mainstream is connected to the ideas that have graded acceptance and prestige among economics economists. Stable categories of neoclassical economics as scarce resource allocation, utilitarianism, magical cal marginal calculus, general equilibrium are not useful for this definition of mainstream. For him, we now have a myriad of non-convergent perspectives, including game theory, behavior economics, new institutional economics, complexity economics, According to David Colander, this variety of perspectives inform us that at the boundary of the discipline, there is flexibility. And this is a, the characteristic of edge work. John Davis emphasized that many things studied in modern mainstream had their origin in economic heterodoxy. Colander 
goes in the same direction, saying that, I quote him, the work at the edge generally begun by younger researchers and in some cases, those who are doing heterodox work. In the sense, Davis highlights behavior economics, economics, which will have reintroduced many concepts associated with the emphasis on the habits of thought of institutional economics. Moreover, experimental economy reintrodu economics reintroduced the idea of that institutional methods. Finally, evolutionary economics will recall the developments of a uh, Vemblinian tradition. On the other side, Davis recognized that there could be a selection bias in the mainstream regarding heterodoxy. In his words, a selective appropriation process that systematically excludes certain, certain types of heterodox contents. Davis' understanding of a selective appropriation process is close to what Tinu Larry highlighted as weak complementarity. That's it's the idea that methodological norms can be borrowed from other schools, but not, but without implying further re research efforts by that school. This explains, for example, the method that uh, allowed mainstream to borrow Veblen's concept of emulation and conspicuous consumption under the idea of a bandwagon or Veblen effect, or the encapsulation of Keynes' ideas into a Hicks Hansen uh, model which uh, Robinson named bastard Keynesianism. And finally, in the context of 2007 crisis, the simplification of Minsky's contribu contributions to his, to his financial stability hypothesis or Minsky moment. Our perspective shows that the innovative character of current, current mainstream is not contradictory to its tendency towards annihilation. Economics is largely established through the continual tension of heterodox ideas existing outside the mainstream and the encapsulation of selected heterodox perspectives. Our analytical framework characterized the mainstream as a selection mechanism as biotechnology in the case one, capable of implementing the interface between what is outside and what is inside. Thus, by incorporating elements of heterodoxy, the mainstream promotes a simultaneous internal innovation to the detriment of an annihilation of what is outside. This annihilation process within economics is well reporter, reported by, by several authors including the works of Frederick Lee. The flexible definition of mainstream as a sociological concept allow us to apply our analytical framework to understand the relationship between innovation and annihilation within economics. If anything were changeable and innovative in the mainstream, it will be largely be, it will largely be the result of heterodoxy. However, this is a significant contradiction. The existence of mainstream as a selection mechanism narrows further innovation. If heterodox, heterodox is eliminated, as is objectively happening, the mainstream will become monolithic and will have nothing more to say other than what has already been said. This is mainstream euthanasia. This is a question. For a concluding remark, uh, we want to highlight that the contradictory relationship between innovation and annihilation is not metaphysical. The role of corporate power underlies the dynamics of our analytical framework. In biotechnology, biotechnological applications, the role of big corporations is almost self-evident. Within economics, the relationship between economic interests of corporate power and academy is a revisitive subject, especially in the moment of a global crisis. However, to understand corporate interest depends on how those interests are translated in a specific field. To solve this problem, we suggest the incorporation of neoliberalism as a selective device within this analytical framework. Neoliberalism as a thought collective, uh, as Mirovsky says, or Mirovsky understanding of, 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 of neoliberalism as a thought collective, 
as a political or economic practice or as an ide ideology, it's a powerful candidate to, for the understanding of what exists and what is expelled from our existence. That includes, among others, economic, economic ideas or even nature. That's it. The end. Thank you. Thank you. And Stop the share. Incredible timing because it's now 18.45, which is exactly 90 minutes uh, for all six presentations. Uh, what I will do now is I will ask one sort of extended question to each one of you, uh, and then uh, I'll sort of read up these six questions, and then you can sort of start from the beginning. So how will we we'll answer first, and you have about, you know, about three minutes or something to, to answer or expand or elaborate or, or whatever, and then we go, go around the room and, and see how much time we have left after that. But hopefully, you know, at least everybody should have the chance to respond once and sort of properly in the beginning. So uh, let me start with the first question to how, and this is how sensitive is uh, crypto or, or cryptocurrencies to interest rate shocks? And so can you see cryptocurrencies essentially as, as zero coupon bonds that will last forever, if you like? Uh, and if so, do you think that uh, crypto is a bubble? Uh, I know it's a difficult question, and uh, I, but I, I expect an answer that is more than just yes or no. Okay. Well, so um, yeah, can I I'll just read up everything and then you can sort of, the others can think about it. So the next question okay. is for, uh, let me see, this was for, Rodrigo, uh, the question is here. So at what level of firm operation is your model? Uh, and here an example from the audience is, is sort of is, is on amazon.com, you can separate production of physical goods versus production of algorithms. And I also thought about this, and how would Uber, if you think about a, as, a, as a raid ride sharing platform, and, and of course, the drivers are the workers, but how, how different is, is the concept of Uber compared to other platforms and algorithms where you don't necessarily have sort of, the worker is not necessarily a driver. Do you see what I mean? Uh, number three is for Anton. Uh, just generally, what is your view? Uh, at the end of your, you had a very interesting presentation, but what do you personally think? Uh, Digital can can and should and how should regulation take place about when it comes to to the ownership what what is out there as a digital footprint that we all have and that is increasing and that is not properly regulated what what is your view here going forward for Scott uh, about sharp ratios first of all is it looks as if the, the sharp ratio is higher for small firm compared to large firms. Is that correct? Uh, and are these daily returns? And finally, does it mean that fracking is, is it worth it or not? Yes or no? Do you want an answer right now or? No, later, later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then the fifth one is about the disappearance of the market itself uh, was very sort of radical, came towards the end of your, your presentation. A very interesting idea. Can you please elaborate more on that? Because I also personally thought this was very interesting. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, this is, uh, please explain more. Uh, and also a second question for David. Uh, when it comes to competition, how, how does it matter if all the, the Facebook, uh, Amazon, Google, and so on, that they are American companies? Uh, you, you sort of compare the European view versus the American view. Does it matter that we actually, all the big tech companies that we're talking about here are really American and not European? The second thing is about your antitrust view that there's one sort of German or European model and one that is Chicago based. Since the financial crisis, banks have been treated very differently in the US compared to Europe. Uh, actually, in this case, I would probably say that 
the US has been tougher when it comes to competition than Europe. Uh, can you please comment on that, whether I'm wrong? Uh, and finally, the final presentation, uh, is mainstream euthanasia possible? Question mark. It would be re a replacement in what we understand as mainstream, wouldn't it? Uh, and also, uh, has this changed since the crisis about heterodox economics? Uh, your references date back to sort of crisis or pre-crisis. Uh, is this still the case? Uh, or if, if I want to be more optimistic, maybe something happened in 2009 and the world is much more rosy these days. I don't know. Maybe you have a pessimistic view, but please, if so, uh, say why. So that should be enough to start off with. Uh, how, if you, if you want to start off? Okay. Uh, for the question whether the cryptocurrency is sensitive to interest rate charts, yes, uh, sure. Uh, because uh, the trading prices of cryptocurrencies have appeared sensitive to interest rate changes. And, uh, However, the extent of each currency of different style need to be measured respectively. Um, uh, then the next question, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, especially Bitcoin-like, are nobody's debt, but a gift or a reward uh, to the work of the miner. Uh, just like you dig and wash and you get gold from the sand. And uh, so uh, it's just don't like the bond. Bond, whether perpetual or with coupon, it's somebody's debt. And the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is nobody's debt. Um, so, uh, this is quite different. Um, in view of asset switching, the price of cryptocurrencies will rise and fall depending on demand and supply of the market. But it is still, uh, from my point of view, still in its early stage when governments can manage to intervene to stop this process, I mean, asset switching. So policy risks contribute significantly to the market risk of cryptocurrency, at least for short run. That's it. Thank you. And then go to Rodrigo, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think to answer that question, I would answer the second in the same, the same idea. So when we are talking about digital platforms, even in the literature, there are differences between different platforms. So platforms of e-commerce and, and labor platforms such as Uber and Lyft. And the, the basis, the theoretical basis I'm using is from Professor Michael Massey from uh, Penn State University. He's working with, he's also working with the sharing economy and he describes these platforms. What is the difference between all of these digital platforms? Uh, it's the layer of control, the layers of control being used in these platforms. So he, um, he presents different layers of control and controlling prices, controlling matching, uh, controlling communication. And these platforms of work of, or the ride hailing platforms would be the example of platforms that have the most uh, layers of control as defined by him. And he uses the idea of in, the industrial relations and the working rules as what the worker can or can't do with the, these working rules. So the difference between the platforms, uh, at least what I'm using as basis for my research is uh, in the layers of control or these working rules directing uh, this, the managerial transactions between workers and uh, the platform. Yeah, 
That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we had Anton. Yes. Um, the question was about the uh, regulation of the uh, uh, platforms or the how to arrange that uh, you can become the owner of uh, your digital uh, you. And um, uh, at the end of my presentation, I suggested that uh, uh, with the uh, blockchain uh, technology, it uh, is able to uh, register uh, your uh, uh, Facebook page or Twitter account or uh, all that kind of stuff in a uh, sort of fault. And that means that uh, uh, you can get your uh, ownership. And uh, now, uh, nowadays, it is uh, the case that when Facebook um, removes, for example, your account, then uh, all your information is gone. So uh, if you will have it in uh, uh, fault, then uh, it uh, stays your uh, property. That is one of the ideas you can uh, think about. Yes? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, and the next one is Scott. Okay, um, I'll, if I can, I'd like to take some of the questions in reverse order, I've written them down. The Tan Weir's question, he brings up the issues of tables uh, being brought into PowerPoint and they're a little bit hard to read. I agree, it wasn't satisfactory. And I wish I could have circled the sharp ratios at the bottom. But the question regarding which one is larger uh, for the independents and the majors, overall, it's the sharp ratios are 0 0.002 for the independents, and the sharp ratios for the majors are negative 0 0.002. So that addresses the issue of which one has uh, what, what the different sharp ratios are up to Tan Weir as well. Tan Weir, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, 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 Tanweer brings up a good point of does the sharp ratio oversimplify risk? I fully agree. Uh, and there are so many different sources of risk in this industry. You've got regulatory, you've got environmental, you've got all these different buckets of risk. So yes, risk is uh, oversimplified, but always what's the alternative? Uh, how, how, how else are we going to measure that? Uh, so that that's how uh, we'd address that. And if you have any points on this, please let me know to anyone. The next one, is it Saeed? Uh, there's a question on a daily, yes, these are daily returns. And it's a, another good, interesting question because results can vary between daily returns, weekly returns, monthly returns, and that's a good question. And so I, I fully accept that. That's a, that'd be interesting to see where it goes. The last question regarding is, Frack te uh, is fracking technology worth it? And that's a value statement that I'm not going to, I, I can't really address, but uh, Bernanke has said, and I think many folks would agree with this, the idea of it's one of the more important revolutions that has occurred. The extension to that is we can look at policies. There are two major policies that come out of this in 1970 and 1990, you had the American Clean Air Act, what that do? What that? What that is doing is primarily addressing how petrochemical carbon-based fuels are burnt, and it gives you what are known the criteria pollutants. And how would that change? I'm working on that right now. Uh, I don't feel comfortable even discussing preliminary findings. On the second policy, there's in August 23rd, 2011, the Environmental Protection Agency change what are known as methane standards over what's prominently known as quad O. Quad O addresses like when you drill, if you'd like, I can, I can uh, post some PBS videos that would, would give you some interesting intuition on what's going on. When oil's brought up, there's methane from the input side. So the American Clean Air Act talks about the output side, the methane story for quad O that's on the input side. Uh, discussing whether or not the technology is worth it. We're addressing it with policy, and that's a value statement that socially we're going to discuss. 
So that's how I would address the three questions, the three questions that brought up in the chat. Thank you. Uh, and Carlos, I will come back to you after everybody has, 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 has answered. The next one is uh, uh, David. It's me, yes. Thank you. Uh, I will start with your, your questions, Alexi. Uh, of course, um, the European way of managing competition is uh, very different than the American way, not only because of its doctrine or the liberal doctrine. It is also different uh, because uh, it is um, uh, the commission, uh, so uh, the commission, the executive power of Europe uh, proceed to, 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 to the case. And, uh, and uh, whereas in America, it is uh, the justice system, the court. Uh, and therefore, it means that there are more poli politics in, in, um, in the European Union uh, when uh, there is uh, some some issues uh, that uh, competitive issues that appear, and of course it means that I believe that the fact that uh, these uh, major uh, companies of internet are all American, I, I, maybe it it does something uh, because it is more political. Uh, however, in Europe, uh, that is something I'm working on now. You also have uh, the the European Court uh, of Justice uh, that now is sometimes disagree uh, with the commission. For instance, the 13 billion euro uh, fine for Apple has, been, uh, uh, has not been approved by the European justice. So there is some tension between the commission and the justice uh, of, and the European ju uh, justice. Uh, what you refer about the bank, I think it's not only a question of competition. It's also a question of the use of the dollar uh, and, and some other aspect uh, of the financial market and the banking system, I think it's, it's not only uh, the question of competition. And then the, the third question is about uh, the, the end of the market. It, it is true that I think the, the most important thing, my, my, my point in this paper was to figure out uh, since we live in a world, in a neoliberal world uh, with institution, neoliberal institutions, that tend to regulate the society through the market by thinking like economists say that the all economy is about the market and the law of supply and demand. We face an issue when the market disappear and the market disappearance means that uh, the transaction are not regulated through uh, either firms or uh, autonomous people or autonomous firm in the field of the market. But now the market are created are regulated by some platform companies. And I think it means that we need to think differently about the functioning of, of our, our economy as an economist. And also we need to think differently all our institutions because, because all institutions are created or tends to, 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 to believe that the economy is a market economy uh, where every individual are, is uh, autonomous which is in fact a fiction because even in the market economy, there are some, uh, uh, some, some uh, power relationship between firms, between firms and people, the producers and consumers and so on. But we tend to, to forget this when we try to, to discuss about the supply, uh, the, the supply and the demand and the, the way the market works. But now we cannot be blind anymore. We, 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 face, we are facing something that is not at all a market. Uh, we are facing um, companies that bring you the the deliverer, uh, the, the the bring give you the job and give you the the the, the, the consumption, and and uh, everything is organized through algorithm, and therefore it is not the product product of autonomous people. And I think if we think about this, uh, it really uh, challenges uh, in the same way all institutions. Uh, and all politics, and also us as economists in order to understand this world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, uh, Manuel. Okay. First, first about the crisis, something happening uh, after the crisis. So 
Um, and this is true. This is true. Something happening. And we have these movements of students, in, especially in France and the UK, uh, calling for pluralism in economics. This is a new thing. And But this is a thing that came as a reaction, as a double movement uh, that is uh, outside the logic of annihilation logic that I'm trying to present here. So I think uh, I think we, we all agree on that, that the, the solution for our economic problems or social problems will came from people, from the real problems, from people, from climate change, from uh, what is outside, because the logic inside our um, reality, it's annihilative. And for the mainstream, the question of Felipe Almeida's question about the, the if is is there a possible it's it's possible for a mainstream euthanasia, and yes, I I I just wrote down mainstream euthanasia on my presentation, but it's not on the paper because it's too strong, but um, it will be a replacement uh, in what we understand a mainstream, and I. We can say maybe yes, and the replacement in, I think, um, in a pessimistic way will be just uh, capitalism, realism, you know, like Mark Fisher's, but it's, but it, it's a just capitalist uh, realism and nothing more. And heterodoxy can put something else to think, and we, don't, we need to stay to defend that. So that's it. That's the, the answer. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now everybody has, has had a chance to, to say something. And, and now we can sort of please ask each other questions if you have, if you have comments or, or questions. But I'll, I'll start with, with Carlos, who raised his hand uh, early on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so an, an amazing uh, panel. Uh, thank you kindly. Uh, just for full disclosure, I do not speak for the World Bank in any way, shape or form. But uh, humbly, I'd like to congratulate the, the, the colleagues on, uh, from uh, Brazil and, and, and China for this kind of cross-border cooperation and thought leadership coming from uh, the developing countries is very heartwarming. Uh, I had the, the two questions, one, one for each. So, uh, Professor Cheng, uh, you mentioned the, the tech issues uh, messing around with sovereign uh, 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 problems. I'm sure you may be following what's happening in Kazakhstan and the disruption on the Bitcoin side. I was wondering if this uh, other side of the, of the, of the puzzle where a massive crisis in a sovereign may disrupt how the technology is, is being perceived uh, around the world. I'm not sure if you followed the next last three days on the mining disruptions in Kazakhstan and the 10, 20% or something. I have not followed it closely. Uh, uh, Professor Luz, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, in, um, so in, in my world, a lot of the, the conversations is also on this idea that uh, you get a, a stratified society. So it's not so much that the algorithm expands across the board, but that it becomes a race to be outside the algorithm's purview, where you have this stratified society. So if you maintain the algorithm, you are above the algorithm. And so you become on the loop, if you will. And everyone else, the unwashed masses, get subjected to the algorithm. And I, I was wondering uh, if you had um, any suggestions or, or insights on this kind of uh, weird stratification process where the, the, the goal is to, to, to live outside the rules of algorithms instead of having this kind of more cooperative approach to it. Um, I was wondering if you had, the, yeah. Uh, my apologies for going a bit outside the, the topic there, uh, Professor Luz, but uh, thank you very much for your, for your uh, insights here. And uh, apologies for, for speaking so long here at this uh, August panel. I know you, everybody's very busy and uh, happy Sunday to all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond, any of you? No. Any any other questions? Have I missed something that I haven't seen? Yeah, Scott. I, I think I think Professor Cheng was muted. That's why. Uh... Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, Sorry. You speak fast, and I just get. Uh, you think uh, uh, we're using technology to solve problems, and uh, we're chasing. We're tracking what's happened in recent days in Hasakistan or some other places in the world, right? So what's the issue? I didn't catch. No, no, no. no. My, my understanding is that the, the Kazakhstan crisis, which is a completely sovereign crisis, right? 
disrupt the global perception of it, right? It's kind of like the, 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 the reverse hand of it from what I understand. Yeah. How, 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 should, should we see that as a, so the, it's a communication loop or not, or just a one way street, I guess? Because uh, you said that the technology is gonna disrupt the way the sovereignty uh, of, of, of currencies work, right? But the other ways might also be true, right? The technologies depend on these sovereignties, right? The internet does not live everywhere. It's an infrastructure that has a little building somewhere, right? Uh, nationalization of data, I'm not sure. Well, anyways, it doesn't matter. I apologize for, for going outside of my topic now. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay. Scott? Yeah. Oh, yes. If I may, yeah. with David, very fascinating, very fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. One, it's agreed that the new platforms call into question traditional antitrust issues. And you talk about variant. Um, Hal Varian's a Berkeley economist, and I've, I've worked out at Berkeley for the last 18 summers. And one of the books he published in 1999, I'm trying to get to my doc cam, is this book, Information Rules. And he talks quite a bit about lock-in. He talks about positive externalities. I don't know if it's coming into focus. Um, but this book is, I, I use this in industrial economics. It's uh, my, So in that book, he talks about these large connectivity results. If I can, I'm going to go back. Uh, it's also in Varian's book as well in terms of his model. Now, I understand some folks may not appreciate that. But what Varian, uh, is, this, is this coming into focus? What Varian is saying in terms of the model in terms of antitrust and just technological issues is that because of the positive externalities of like Google and things like that, uh, we can't get, I don't think we can get technologically away from that. Uh, I think, I, I know, I discuss with these students constantly the issue of Bing. Why do we not use Bing? Because it's a small platform and that's, that's exactly what Google, uh, what Variant's talking about. So we'd like larger platforms for things where you have these positive externality effects. So as I'm listening to your discussion, how does this fit within the populist neoliberal framework I would think that the populists would like a large, would it be a more free access to it? Or how would that work, David? In terms of positive externalities. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I, Variant is a great economist. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, not this book, but a uh, more recent book uh, uh, to my class, uh, to my, for my student also, because I think he sees something important, uh, the, the network's effect and the ability for big firms to to, to provide a very a good service uh, to uh, not only to consumers, but to other firms. And I, I think is I, I presented, of course, maybe I, I was joking a little bit, but uh, his, his uh, argument is, um, sorry, his, um, um, uh, his thinking, his theory is it's not absurd at, at all. Uh, there is uh, some good thing. The, the question is how do we regulate uh, these new uh, services provided by, by big platform companies. And this is my, my main question, because if we listen to Varian, then there is nothing to do. Uh, it's, we all live in the best world, but when you read uh, Soshana Zuboff or when you read uh, Cyril Durand, you see that, yes, there are issues, but not only economic issues, but political and democratic issues, which means that you cannot only decide that because it is economically efficient, it is good. Uh, because uh, the politics has also something to say about these uh, monopolistic platforms and the way they, they, they organize themselves. And then the question is not only today, but it is tomorrow. Uh, if we've found into a feudal system where uh, these companies are, are, are benefit from a rent and without uh, having to, to innovate. It is exactly what explained Cédric Durand. Uh, the innovation was before uh, when it, it has to con conquer the, the market, but now no that they are monopolistic. Uh, do Google need to innovate in its research engine anymore? Uh, I, I think the, these are important questions, but maybe not questions for today, but maybe questions for tomorrow or for 10 years. Certainly. 
Thank you. Um, any more questions or, or reflections or comments? Uh, from the I, I was wondering if the yeah. or, or Professor Constantino who, who had any uh, comments or, or something because I wasn't sure if it was uh, clear that my question was to Professor Constantino and maybe I pronounced it incorrectly. I'm originally from Brazil, so I apologize for my uh, bad English. Sorry, uh, I thought you had asked for Professor Luz. Yes, I pronounced it uh, incorrectly. I apologize. It's, yeah, it's, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. I apologize. It's entirely my fault. You guys have better English than me. So I. No, but, come on. Yeah. but uh, actually, I didn't get your question there. Uh, could, could you repeat that? Thank oh, you. yeah. I don't know. So it's, my understanding was that you, you get this weird stratified society, right? Where you um, the okay. algorithm, it becomes a, a fight not to. to be different types of algorithm, but not be a part of the algorithm at all and be the one maintaining the algorithm. Such a weird stratified oh. society where it's kind of like this, uh, at least that's what the, the general complaint that I get in, in my world, right? It's, uh, you are the global government, what the hell do you think you are? You're telling me what to do. And the, the, mm -hmm. the, it becomes a race against not being the Amazon uh, person mm -hmm. who has to pee in a bottle because uh, the algorithm tells me that I have okay. to keep running around like a, a, a rat in a maze. So, uh I'm going to answer that uh, thinking about how I plan to proceed with my uh, my studies in this matter. So uh, I'm planning on conducting uh, interviews with Brazilian unions of um, uh, Uber drivers, especially in Sao Paulo, that they are growing to be a great political force in the middle of this crisis that we are facing now in Brazil. And following some paths from literature, uh, the work of these unions is to it's trying to overcome uh, the surveillance of these platforms in, in the case of the algorithm. So the argument is that gamification as a way of making workers behave the way platform wants to do, actually gamification would be how workers respond and try to overcome how these algorithms are acting towards them and this surveillance and how they're working. So um, that's that's the path I'm following. So how how workers respond to the algorithms by uh, playing with the algorithm. So the gamification is the defensive response of workers towards uh, the platforms. I'm working in that way. Th thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry to have interrupted uh, you, Professor, my humble. Uh, no, so any more questions? Otherwise, um, shall we? Oh, Scott, did you have something to say? Well, I have a clarification. Somebody's asked um, in terms of investment proposals. Uh, I, just before this meeting, I, I, I've taken oil producers and downstream oil consumers like freight and these other industries. And these, a lot of the questions are coming from like sharp ratio discussions. Between the period of about 2000 and 2020, what we can note across those different industries, I've broken it down into five different categories for the oil industry. And then I go outside the oil industry for like airline freight, ground freight, and these different areas. Just for the, the, the question that has come up to me, preliminary results is with the fracking revolution, sharp ratios are falling for the oil industry more than other industries. That's preliminary. My gut sense is that's changing somewhat the investment opportunities and what would be best. So that's my that, that's the, the clarification of the question that's been sent to me. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I mean, these topics are, are going to remain topical next year as well. I don't think this is sort of the last time we talk about either fracking or, or, or uh, crypto or digital technology. So hopefully- Professor in a very kind of unorthodox uh, thing, is it okay if I say something in 20 seconds? Just to, yes, to, uh, to annoy please, people, no, I apologize. Yeah. So yeah, the, the I will White have the House, final word, yes. Yes, so the White House in the January 15th it has the office of the OSTP 
has an open request for comment on their attempts at creating a bill of rights for an automated society. I would humbly uh, uh, suggest maybe if it's of use or interest to anyone to just uh, send the paper with a cover sheet saying, uh, we believe this is an important thing that you should consider because uh, this would uh, at least force a, a, an official answer uh, from the regulators as they try to set up this new agenda for a uh, bill of rights for an automated society. At least that's what they call it at this point. I'm not sure if it's useful to anyone, but uh, as a humble regulator and a bureaucrat, a faceless bureaucrat, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, yeah. So, sorry for this, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to follow up as well, or links or anything. Like, for maybe if I can put the link on the, the chat, I don't know if it's going to close and so no one's going to get the link anymore. But the, the link doesn't Google work it. any. The link doesn't work, I think, any longer. But what you could do, if it would be great actually, if you could email me something and I will share it with the whole team. So Alexis Denforce, if you just you Google me, you'll find my my email address. Uh, there's nobody else with my name in the world yet. Uh, so, so, so so there's there's only me. So if you if you send me just a link or something like that, I can then share with with the rest of the team. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Sorry about this, sir. Thank you. No problem. We're Thank kind you of so much. Much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, great to meet you all. Uh, hopefully, see you in in uh, in Louisiana next year. For real, that would be fantastic. Uh, okay, thank you very much, and have a good evening or morning or, or night in China. I go back yes. to bed. Uh, it's it's for the three o'clock in the morning or something, I guess, in in East China. We're still dark. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> still thank dark. You. Okay, thank you. Alex. It's three three twenty one okay. in the morning. <laughs> okay, let's uh, have a good one. Take care. Thank you, Take Alexis. Care. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.